Today you're going to do some activities which revise word classes, explore language in detail, study how precise meaning is crafted in literary language, deconstruct and understand the nature of narrative recounting in the text, and explore the creation of poetic voice and viewpoint. In 1757, Edmund Burke had described the sublime in nature as the exciting feelings of awe and terror. These feelings, once ascribed to a traditional view of God, in a post-enlightened world, are now transferred to nature. And the Romantics concern themselves with how the individual place themselves in that world. So Caspar David Friedrich in the German Romantic movement explores the forces of nature, which he sees as sublime, the power, the awe, the majesty, and the individual is often at the center of that. If you look at these paintings, you can see how the forces of nature are not only shown as beautiful, spectacular and grand, a subject that had been ignored for centuries, now they are the forces at work in the universe, the power of creation, the power of nature to shape, transform and develop the very stuff of the planet. In this painting, Friedrich creates a landscape that is beautiful, harmonious and all of the things that the ascetics demand. But he also does something more. He tries to paint time and so just as Shelley in Ozymandias explores the ravages of time, here we see time through the three or four ships. They're journeying, the small boats, the larger boats, going into the distance and disappearing. But on the shore also, we see a child, a family, a father, possibly a grandfather. All of these images create the sense of time passing, and that is the subject of the painting. Here are the lyrics to Traherne's hymn, song, Wonder. In it is a very traditional Christian view of creation and how spectacular the works of heaven are by a creator God. And all the works of God so bright and pure, so rich and great did seem as if they ever must endure in my esteem. Traherne uses creation to create this romanticized view of the earth and how wonderful it is. He praises God through it, he praises the earth through it, and it is a eulogy to the wonders of creation. That is what Heaney alludes to in this text. Hailstones. My cheek was hit and hit, sudden hailstones pelted and bounced on the road. When it cleared again, something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn and left me there with my chances. I made a small, hard ball of burning water running from my hand, just as I make this now, out of the melt of the real thing, smarting into its absence. To be reckoned with, all the same, those brats of showers, the way they refused permission, rattling the classroom window like a ruler across the knuckles, the way they were perfect first, and then in no time, dirty slush. Thomas Traherne had his orient wheat for proof and wonder, but for us, it was the sting of hailstones and the unstingable hands of Eddie Diamond foraging in the nettles. Nipple and hive, Bite lumps, small acorns of the almost pleasurable intimated and disallowed when the shower ended and everything said, wait, for what? For 40 years to say, there, there, you had the truest foretaste of your aftermath. In that dilation, when the light opened in silence 
and a car with wipers going still laid perfect tracks in the slush. In the first stanza, Heaney recounts the memory of a hailstorm, of being hit and hit, the suddenness of it, the violence of it, the pelting and the bouncing on the road. He sees himself as a victim stuck in this storm, but it's much more than that. It lasts, it stays with him. When it cleared again, something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn. Something whipped is a violent action, but it is withdrawn. It's not happening to him. It's almost pulled from him. Something that he has known has gone. And it leaves him there with his chances. Chances is an interesting word in the sense that now he is not secure. There is no sense of knowing what will be. That there is a randomness in the universe after this storm. Something that can violently attack and create a vulnerability in him. This is a moment for him where the world has changed. The hailstones attack him. They fall and he feels vulnerable and weak. I made a small hard ball of burning water running from my hand. Just as he takes the ice after the storm and crushes it so that it melts, he now takes the moment, the memory of that, and creates the poem. Just as I make this now out of the melt of the real thing. In this metaphor, the melt of the real thing, the poem is what is left after the experience. The adult poet looks back at his past, takes the memory and constructs this significant text that explores how we make sense of things, how moments, an epiphany, an apostrophe, some light dawning, some growing awareness and enlightenment from the experience of life. Just as I make this now, this deictically points to the poem itself, literally, but also to the truth held in the poem, the wisdom from this. And it's smarting into its absence, just as he has been hit by the snow, the ice, and the skin smarts. Psychologically, he smarts from what is lost. There is a violent understanding here of how the world can be. And the fact that he is left to face his chances creates that vulnerability in a world that's less secure as to what is happening. In the second stanza, we go to another hailstorm earlier in his childhood when he's at school to be reckoned with all the same, those brats of showers. The storms of life are to be reckoned with. They confront us. They force us in their powerful way to, to change action, to do things we don't want to do. And here, the childish personification of the showers as brats have caused them to be stuck inside at playtime. The children are refused permission and there they are rattling the classroom windows like rulers across the knuckles. Heaney personifies the storm rather like a rebuking parent, a rebuking teacher who punishes, forces them to stay in, to deny them the pleasure that they want. The way they were perfect first and then in no time dirty slush. You have that realization of the beauty, the awe and the wonder of a storm, but also the aftermath, the dirty slush, the spoilt nature. We're then told of Thomas Traherne and his Orient wheat. For Thomas Traherne, seeing the wheat was proof and wonder of God, of a creator God, awe-inspiring, who has made all things for his grandeur, his glory. But in this poem, the hailstorm seems to destroy something. Heaney sees himself as a victim, attacked. 
and he looks back and he sees how facing the hardships of life like he has to endure the sting and the violent assault of the hail is part of life similarly as a child the hailstones are a test the sting of the hailstones and the unstingable hands of eddie diamond foraging the nettles they become myths of how we endure how we are resilient to what life throws at us whether that's eddie diamond putting his hands to prove his manliness or anyone facing the hailstones of life and having to endure in the last stanza again we have the aftermath and he describes the effects of those hailstones hitting him creating lumps bumps on his skin the nipple and hive the bite lumps almost small acorns they are the shapes also of the hailstones they're pleasurable ideas pleasurable words the whole thing is a joy it's intimated suggested but disallowed there's a sensuality about that about how this violence also evokes ideas imagery that isn't quite in keeping and when the shower ended and everything said wait the whole moment is personified as if speaking to say wait this moment the moment of the hailstone from his past is now called up to evoke what something significant some wisdom some truth and the poet even questions for what the direct question for what for 40 years to say there there you had your truest foretaste of your aftermath the foretaste of an aftermath is knowing your finality knowing your mortality your death is that hailstone storm the moment that Heaney realizes that he is weak and vulnerable and susceptible to whatever terrors the universe can throw at him in that dilation when the light opened in silence and a car with wipers going still laid perfect tracks in the slush that's the realization the truth of the poem the truth the dilation the seeing of that wisdom the light he sees is the reality of his mortality and it's there scraped across the windscreen in the slush Traherne's writings frequently explore the glory of creation and what he perceived as his intimate relationship with God his writing conveys an ardent almost childlike love of God and is compared to similar themes in the works of later poets William Blake, Walt Whitman and Gerard Manley Hopkins. His love for the natural world is frequently expressed in his works by a treatment of nature that evokes romanticism two centuries before the Romantic movement. By referring to Traherne, Heaney is evoking that childhood innocence, the Romantic view of a creator God but also the post-romantic understanding of the supernatural power of nature, the individual in creation or in the natural order who has to endure. Traherne's life and work has been celebrated with his stained glass windows in Hereford Cathedral in the Audley Chapel. In stanza one there are a significant number of uh, prosaic features that help construct the memory and the moment of the hailstorm in the first stanza itself you have the personal pronoun my this possessive pronoun shows that it's all about him and what happened to him and the consequences to him and then when the hailstone hits you have a succession of short vowels and strong 
plosives. My cheek was hit and hit. Sudden hailstones pelted and bounced on the road. That rattle of sounds ends on road. The final cadence of that D stopping. And when it cleared again, something whipped. The whipped there is like an echo. The short vowel is the it's assonance with the I in. Hit and hit. Whatever it is, it's whipped. And the fact that it's something suggests it's vague, unknown, and the consequences of it haven't been appreciated yet. But it is there. When it cleared again, something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn. Knowledgeable is known, but it's not known, it's knowable, knowledgeable, wisdom, something deep, mysterious, that's not totally fully appreciated, and it has withdrawn. The knowledgeable has a number of syllables in it, which makes it quite uncomfortable. When it had cleared again, something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn. A slow easing out, a slow realisation. And it left me there with my chances. Again, we've got personal pronouns, me, my, I, my hand, just as I make this now. It's all about Heaney and the impact it has had on him in the past it's had on him in his life and now how he articulates that in constructing this voice to consider the impact of nature on mankind just as he's left with the ball there the small hard ball of the ice it becomes a metaphor of some burning truth the burning water the slow aftermath and realisation and it runs from my hand just like the words running from the pen in his hand so metaphorically as the ice melts the reality sinks deeper just as I make this now you've got the contrasting deictic pronouns there back in time at that moment and this the poem now here immediately the response and out of the melt of the real thing smarting into its absence interestingly the poet is smarting there's a pain there not just from the pain from being hit but the smarting realization on his psychology his understanding about this absence and there's a an irony in this absence because the absence is a loss of something a loss of innocence, an experience now known. And yet it's also a realisation. So there's something created in this, a truth that is constructed. So there's an uneasy tension about the word absence. To be reckoned with all the same, those brats of showers. It's quite a colloquial phrase um, with a lot of ellipsis and the syntax is unusual too. We might say, those showers are to be reckoned with all the same, but we don't get that. We get the faltering structure of Heaney's um, poetic voice, like a stream of consciousness to be reckoned with all the same. Those brats of showers. There is a reckoning, an understanding, a judgment, a response to being attacked by nature and he calls them those brats of showers with a more adult voice but it adopts a childish word the brats of showers there's a tension there too the way they refused permission Heaney has got the voice of the young child denied and here you see that tension as he recalls it but there's also a sense of the hurt child in the adult Heaney, who has been denied or refused something that he perhaps still wants. Just like the hailstorm in his childhood was rattling the classroom windows, you have the simile like rulers across the knuckles to personify the storm as the adult rebuke 
the punishment, the way they were perfect first, and then in no time dirty slush. And again, you got a movement from innocent perfection to dirty realization, to the experience of an adult world, looking back on something that was innocent and pure and now is no longer. Thomas Traherne is aligned with the proof and wonder of the innocent, glorious world. And that contrasts with the alternating connective, but for us, and that plural pronoun has Heaney adopting something that he does at times, and he speaks for his people, he speaks for his generation, for us, or for the children in his primary school. It was the sting of hailstones and the unstingable hands of Eddie Diamond that created ideas of pain, of the power of nature, but also the resilience of humanity. Eddie Diamond foraging in the nettles might be mythic amongst the children, but it is also something of an adult decision to be sensible, to endure, to be resilient. We get a list in the first line of the third section, nipple, hive, bite lumps, three images, and then the small acorns as well. They are the shape of the hailstones. They are the marks of the hailstones, like bite lumps. They interact with us, creating pain, marring, scarring our bodies in some ways. But they're also pleasurable, like acorns, to hold smooth. These images are intimated but disallowed, as if there's some illicit friction between the ideas that are pleasurable but also not pleasurable, as if the pain of the reality removes that pleasure that we anticipate. When the shower ended, we're back in the present, in a contemporary hailstorm, not the childhood one. We're back to the hailstorm on the road that has stopped his car. And everything said, wait. It's as if nature is now personified and speaks, heralds some realization. Wait, wait for the truth, wait for the realization, wait for the epiphany, for what the poetic voice asks, a direct thought and an answer for 40 years to say, there, there, you had the truest foretaste of your aftermath. Now, the pronouns you and your here make it personal again, as if someone is addressing Heaney, you and your aftermath. Or Heaney could be addressing us in a generic way. We all have our moment of realisation. And the deictic pronouns there, there, they say there at that moment, there you had your realisation. Or is it? A direct voice saying there, there in a comforting, consoling way to pacify the hurt child. There, there. You had your truest foretaste of your aftermath. Both ideas resonate in those words. In that dilation, when the light opened in silence. Back with that deictic pronoun, that. It points back to that moment again, the moment of realisation, when the light opened in silence. And the adverbial, adverbial tells us where it is. The light opened in silence. The moment of realisation. Almost a transfiguration from innocence to experience. But when is this moment? A car with wipers going still laid perfect tracks in the slush. The moment of realisation for Heaney. You have a foretaste in childhood when we learn that hail stings and is cold. But the poet, the adult poet here, looks back and realises, as an adult, the true significance of his mortality and sums it up in the poem Hailstones.